very warm welcome to our speaker for this evening, Sarita Sundar, who joins us from Bangalore today. Um, we've been through a couple of months of strange experiences, all of us, and one of them can certainly be called posture. So the title of this evening's talk, Power, Privilege and Posture, I think is most apt. We've all been working from the comfort of our homes, sometimes not too comfortable, but I'd hope for the majority of us, for the majority of time, it has been comfortable. So on behalf of the trustees and the chairperson of the CSMVS, my colleagues at the Museum Society, the Director General, Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, and all of us present here, those who've joined us from Godridge Archives and Rinda Patare, who heads our archives, a very warm welcome to you, Sarita. We're delighted that you agreed to do this talk. And I, for one, as you know, am greedily looking forward to this evening. A few words about Sarita. Sarita's practice and research spans heritage studies, popular material, visual culture, and design theory. Over the years, she has engaged in critical inquiries into how culture engages with the visual, ranging from research into Indian vernacular typography to studies of intangible culture in performance practices. At Hanno, Sarita's company, she combines her 30 years of working with brand strategy and design solutions, coupled with her academic training in museum studies and heritage interpretations. She has a postgraduate in visual communication from the National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, and a Master of Arts in Museum Studies from the University of Leicester in the UK. She ran an award-winning multidisciplinary design company called Trapeze for a decade before moving her focus to her research interests at Hano. She received the prestigious Professor Eileen Hooper Greenhill Academic Prize in 2016 from the School of Museum Studies at the University of Leicester. And she's a recipient of an arts research grant from the India Foundation for the Arts through which she looked at object systems that surround ritual performance in a Kerala, Kerala village festival. We'll look forward to that talk one day, Sarita. She's a visiting faculty at National Institute of Design, Ahmedabad, and Shristi School of Art, Design, and Technology in Bangalore. A little bit about this evening's lecture, Power, Privilege, and Posture. Sarita will showcase just a vignette from her five-year-long research that looks through the lens of socially networked experiences at a very ubiquitous and almost taken for granted activity an object from everyday life, seating in India, and the material culture that surrounds it. The talk will explore how power and dominion are established and exercised through vernacular, colonial, and contemporary expressions of the seat or the chair. This project was initiated by Hanno in collaboration with Godridge Archives, and it will culminate eventually in a publication and definitely a digital exhibition, virtual exhibition, if not an actual exhibition. One has to raise the bar, and I think I'm throwing out a challenge to the archives team and to Sarita about actually doing an exhibition on this subject one day. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, all of you for joining us here this evening. Thank you, the technical team who always help us. And thank you so much, Vrinda and Sarita. And now I hand you over to Vrinda Pathare, the Chief Archivist at Godridge Archives. Thank you. Technical team. Thank you, Dr. Feroza Godrich, and uh, thank you everyone at the Museum Society of Mumbai and CSMVS for collaborating with us for this series of Thursday talks that we initiated as Godrich Archives. 
so good evening everyone uh, to this series and before we proceed further let me quickly inform you about Kodraj Archive. Conceived in 1997 and formally started in 2006, Godrej Archives is a corporate archive preserving the history of 123-year-old Godrej group of companies. We archive histories of its products, manufacturing plants, and people, and we are also trying to make it available for research. To encourage research in business history, we have also started research fellowships and scholar-in-residence program since 2018. Godrej Archives works along with historians, writers, designers to reinvent new meanings about the past and we strive to communicate this history through exhibitions, publications, installations, etc. And the series of Thursday talk that we have been organizing during the lockdown in collaboration with the Museum Society and CSMVS is one such initiative. Uh, today I am particularly very happy to have Sarita Sundar as a speaker for our third Thursday talk because our association with Sarita really goes long back. Godrej Archives in fact collaborated with her in 2016 and she wonderfully designed the first commercial publication of the Godrej Archives with great truth and regard to the story of the typewriter in India. It talked about different facets of the typewriter and her design and through her design we were able to create an experience of typewriter uh, which would have been otherwise a forgotten memory. In 2017, she designed a permanent exhibition on the history of Godrej at Godrej Archives, which I would welcome you all to visit once the lockdown is over. And in 2019, we embarked on another journey together when Godrej Archives commissioned this project, Seating in India, in collaboration with Sarita. This project, as uh, Dr. Godrej has said, that will eventually culminate in a publication and exhibition and it will demonstrate how seating was both influenced by social history, context, and human behavior. And today, Sarita would speak about one such aspect of seating that has been dealt with in the book. And I'm eagerly looking forward to getting the first glimpse of one of the chapters in the book that she will be presenting today. Over to you, Sarita. Um, thank you so much. Uh... Mrs. Godrich and uh, Brinda for that very kind introduction. Thank you also to Jason and his team at the Museum Society of Bombay and uh, CSVMS for facilitating this and to all of you for attending this event. I've always enjoyed visiting your museums in Mumbai. Ours here in Bangalore sort of really pale in comparison. So um, this project has really been a very uh, protracted one in the making. Uh, five years back, when I shared a paper on the subject of seating in India with uh, Brinda and Firoza Godrej, uh, providentially, the Godrej archives themselves were looking for the next object to concentrate on after the typewriter and were considering the chair. And I'm extremely grateful for this very, very enjoyable collaboration that resulted. I do believe not a, a week has actually gone by, I'm sure. Um, when Brinda and I haven't exchanged pictures of chairs in sometimes sort of compromising situations. I mean, the chairs in compromising situations, not uh, us. So much like uh, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher, the German philosopher chose to study shoes as a way to examine culture. This project has chosen the seat. And like him, we ask not only of form and material, but also of purpose and agency. We look at the seat as something that is broader and more essential than its physical characteristics. So in that sense, we are concerned with the seat's relationship, yes, with the people that sit on it, but also those in its periphery, the power it wields and the power it grants by sheer association. We ask, what is the seat for? What are the worlds to which it belongs? What worlds have and will be owned by it? And if Heidegger looked at the shoeiness in Van Gogh's shoes in, you know, in the painting that you can see on the screen, we look at the seatiness in seats or to an extent the kursiness in a kursi. When I interviewed uh, Gajanan Upadhyay, um, who was a faculty who is, well, he was the faculty along with MP Ranjan, um, both of them were key in setting up the furniture curriculum at the National Institute of Design. Jiu, as he's fondly called within the National Institute of Design circles, asked me in, him, in this very, very inimitable way of his, but why are you looking at chairs? You aren't a furniture designer. 
so yes, I'm not one, and I may well be guilty of looking at seats and chairs merely as a way to open up worlds. And I believe as one of the most ubiquitous and expressive of cultural objects, um, they sort of interweave the history of technology, the history of style, but what is most useful is that we can embed the history of ideas onto them. And I do believe that something, an object like a chamach or a spoon may not quite offer the same opportunities for, for the same thing. And it, to an extent by seeing them as actors, we see how they play an integral role in our stories. René Magritte's painting, The Treachery of Images, Ceci Nespa Yun Peep, is a sort of playful counterpoint to the themes in this talk. And like the painting that forces us to consider things beyond their first glance, this pastiche of Magritte's painting is a reminder that the seat often serves a function beyond seating, of elevating a person to a position of power, of assisting in functional chores, of playing an important role in a ritual. Um, sometimes it could be used to dress up a room. In my own house, a not so comfortable chair often fills in as a cloth stand. Indeed, Ceci Nespa Yun Shays, this is not a chair. It could well be an instrument of manipulation, an object designed literally to keep people in their place. Please indulge me for a while, uh, while I step back to possibly the real beginning of my interest in the seat going back not five, but maybe about 45 odd years, my grandfather's seat. And I'm sure many of you have one of these in your memory stashes, if not in your homes. It was the dignity and loftiness with which my maternal grandfather assumed his seat that drew me and most of the village to his side over and over again. The leaning chair or charu kasala in Malayalam upon which he sat upon which he spent most of his day was a standard issue teak and canvas model. Every morning, a fresh white muslin towel was laid out. Every morning, he would pick it up, shake it out, use it to swat the chair assiduously, stretch it as if to ensure symmetry, and lay it down with utmost precision before assuming his position on the veranda. It was a station of vantage and power, angled as it was to afford prospect of any approaches to the house or of any emerging from within. His percipience and reputation for astute advice saw villagers seeking his darshan or counsel often. They were afforded positions determined by their social standing across from him on seats much like this, benches with backs, benches without backs, stools, or none at all, where the most confident found spots on the inner or outer steps and the less stood diffidently in the compound. I would watch this scene with curiosity when I visited my grandparents in Kerala. Curiosity tinged with awe and discomfort. Awe at how my gentle grandfather and chair played a role in this very feudal tableau. Discomfort at how my gentle grandfather and chair played a role in this very feudal tableau. The narration of this anecdote is really not, it's not really mere, uh, you know, indulgent nostalgia. But it is a demonstration that spanning the ages from rural homes, courts and palaces in ancient India to modern day boardrooms and living rooms, the politics of posture and position through the practice of seating offers fundamental insights into hierarchies determined by gender, class, caste and race, the lives of oppressors and their oppressed and helped and actually continues to help to accentuate power structures. And while we may remain in awe, it is the discomfort or the unease that we feel that makes us question and understand all this just a bit better. It is of some interest that across cultures, the seat is metaphorically and etymologically linked to power. We have terms like seats of power, chairperson, sitting on the hot seat, kisa kursika, and some words actually further indicate how we use the seats. The word chair comes from cathedra, kata meaning down, and hedra to sit, throne from there meaning to hold or support. So the throne sort of supports and the chair is a place to sit down. Asan, the word for seat in Sanskrit means posture. The Urdu word for floor seating, betak, also means a meeting place. 
the word kursi or chair in Hindi and most North Indian languages, as well as in actually Kannada and Telugu in the South, can be traced to the Arabic word for throne, while the South Indian word kasela comes from the Portuguese, cadera for chair. Curiously, um, the chair is also called nalukalige in Telugu, literally the four-legged one, distinguishing it from other forms of elevated seats that had four or more legs or from mudas, you know, with cylindrical bases. Today's talk is a vignette, as uh, Rinda was sort of telling you, of a much larger project. It is um, a sort of a few themes from a chapter of a forthcoming book that takes a broad sweep of 100 plus seats in India, arranged thematically, uh, not quite chronologically, where we look at seats from ancient India, the vernacular seat, the colonial seat, the colonial chair, the influence of global modernism in India, all the way down to seats that are part of today's postmodern world of sorts, where the past and the present collide into a melee of influences. I'm sure you may all be familiar with at least some of these seats in these silhouettes. Before setting out, it may be important to ask a very, very sort of fundamental question. How do seats actually achieve power and grant privilege? It is quite possible they do so by differentiating themselves, using elevation or excessive ornamentation to convey superiority, or encouraging distinguishing postures. The placement of chairs itself is one of the oldest forms of gamemanship. But our interest here is more in the ways that defy all, or, and you know, sort of break all these rules, that withstand these obvious categorization, that aren't ornamented, but are ordinary, that aren't elevated, or even positioned in any particularly special way, and yet still manage to have agency. When one thinks of power, one thinks of kings and thrones. Across India and through the ages, thrones have had their own particular shape and size, their peculiar histories, unique motives, and singular ornamentation, each with legacy and each aspiring to legend. Every throne, exceptional in craftsmanship and detail, lavish, ornate, resplendent with jewels and gold, ivory and silk, is unique and magnificent. But what truly earns them their place in history goes beyond the material and craftsmanship, beyond the omnipresent sort of lions and peacocks that we often find in Indian uh, sort of seats of power and thrones. So is it, as uh, German philosopher Walter Benjamin says, their presence in time and space, you know, that renders them priceless. The throne sort of assimilating the energies and stories associated with powerful rulers and then empowering those who sit upon them. It was in 1635, seven years into the reign of the grandest of the great Mughals, Shah Jahan, the dazzling peacock throne was inaugurated in a splendid ceremony in Agra before it actually eventually moved to Shah Jahan, Shah Jahan Nabad in uh, Redfort in Delhi. Uh, the throne was part of a deliberate spectacle, uh, a spectacle that directly referenced the fabled King Solomon and all that he embodied. The throne's grandeur, detailing, and even the steps that led up to it bore striking resemblance to King Solomon's throne in many of its details and decorative elements. Its resplendence, its grandeur, and its elevation, lifting the emperor closer to heaven than earth, helped to perpetuate the belief that he ruled by virtue of divine right. The peacock throne, and you can see why it's called so from those you know, really tiny birds on its canopy, those little ones there. It took about seven years to build at possibly twice the cost of the Taj Mahal and was said to have had a confusion of diamonds as well as other jewels, granting power, grandeur and spiritual authority to the succession of Mughal kings who ruled from it. Shah Jahan's magnificent rule was followed by the brute strength of his son, Aurangzeb's. Sub subsequent reigns weakened by years of political intrigue and military instability, saw Nadir Shah of Persia attack the crumbling sort of Mughal empire in 1739 and the city of Delhi plundered by his marauding army. The picture you see on the left is of Nadir Shah on the peacock throne. Legend has it that the takings from the city and its treasury, among them the fabled peacock throne, was laid, loaded onto 700 elephants 
4,000 camels and 12,000 horses and whisked away to Persia. Once again, much like it had for the Mughals, the throne now became symbolic of imperial privilege in Persia. In 1747, less than 10 years after his invasion and ravaging of India, Nadir Shah was assassinated. The peacock throne was taken apart. Each part became its own prized object. The most renowned, most of you would know, the Kohinoor diamond has had its own colorful history, traveling to Lahore, where it was briefly part of Maharaja Ranjit Singh's treasures, before ending up as part of the British crown jewels. And while the original peacock throne may have been destroyed and its parts scattered, tales of the power and prestige it bestowed perpetuated, amplifying its allure. In India and abroad, replicas and representations were commissioned and made in the hope that pomp and privilege would once again visit he who sat upon it. The Mughals had a second built. Persia acquired a new peacock throne. The picture on the right shows uh, the one that they have with these sort of very, very tiny peacocks, not on the canopy, but on the actual pedestal itself, on the platform itself. And further west, King Ludwig II of Bavaria, in keeping with Europe's interest in Orientalist fashion at that time, commissioned a flamboyant version for his palace. By the late 18th century, the Mughal Empire had shrunk significantly from its glory of the 1600s, where it stretched over a large part of the continent to very little beyond the capital of Delhi. So that by the time of Shah Alam II's shaky but long reign, a, a saying was doing the round. Sultanat e Shah Alam as Dilli ta Palam, or the empire of Shah Alam is from Delhi to Palam. Palam, the suburb of Delhi, which most of you would know, is where the present Delhi airport is. So the, the, the kingdom was really effectively only from the Red Fort to about where the Delhi airport is. As recorded by a British official towards the end of this emperor's reign, the end of Shah Alam's reign, such is the vanity of earthly grandeur and the uncertainty of mortal power, the descendant of the great Akbar and the victorious Aurangzeb was found an object of pity blinded and aged, stripped of authority and reduced to poverty, sitting under a small tattered canopy, the fragment of regal state and the mockery of human pride. And yet, in portraits of Shah Alam too, we find him seated on the gilded and bejeweled structure of the recreated peacock throne, a simulacrum with exiguous regard for the reality that existed outside the frame of the image. And so it was with Akbar Shah II, uh, the image on the, la on the extreme left, on the extreme right, sorry. And here you see the Europeans sort of closing in into the court in various hierarchical positions. Uh, do note the difference in this throne from the previous ones, the peacock somewhat larger on this canopy. During the Indian mutiny of 1857 with the capture of Delhi by the British troops, the throne and the platform of the replaced a peacock throne was destroyed. An officer left in charge of the palace save two of the four pedestals which supported this platform. One of which found its way to the Kensington Palace in, in London. And it appears from records that the Metropolitan Museum of New York purchased the remaining pedestal in the early parts of the 20th century with the ensuing sort of mystery and aura surrounding the pedestal to this very day. We are reliant on court chronicles, biographies of the emperors, accounts of travelers, and the minutely detailed miniature paintings by which to conjure the privilege that the peacock throne conferred. Textual and visual accounts differ almost more than they coincide, from costs which varies from sort of four to 24 crores of rupees and to design and detail. Some speak of, peacock, of two peacocks, others speak of sort of 24 peacocks. What I find interesting is that notwithstanding the many inconsistencies in paintings and records that call to question the authenticity of the qualities attributed to the original, the allure, the aura, and the power of the throne have endured through its reproductions, its representations, and its parts. Even if they're not always capable of having the agency of the original, 
All these in some ways testing what Walter Benjamin says of reproductions, their lack of authenticity and therefore thereby their inability to hold on to the aura of the original. So what I'm saying is that in some way, a lot of these reproductions, even the paintings have managed in some way to hold on to the sort of aura that was associated with the original um, peacock throne. Today, we see how objects and images and myths are used. In fact, choreographed to capture and manipulate people's imaginations and to perpetuate power. In social media, we have meticulously curated images. Looking at this here, we know that this isn't a new phenomenon by any means. People have been doing this down to great detail, adding the appropriate props behind us, positioning ourselves to capture ourselves in the best light, literally and metaphorically. And this was no less the case in the Mughal period too. Image makers, both commissioned or seeking patronage, eulogized rulers. And yes, on occasion, falsifying information. All elements from the elevation of the throne towards heaven to the relative position of the various figures in the painting, right down to the decorative patterns, played to the belief that he who ruled from it was supreme, almighty, invisible, invincible. Semiotic decoding reveals a form of po political posturing, stances used by the powerful through the ages. Then and as now, it would appear that politics moves forward, not just through realities, but also through images. And the seat, the peacock throne in this example, is key in this image making and semiotic code. While 16th century European accounts of India mentions no chairs and speak of the widespread custom of sitting on the floor for various activities, there is actually enough evidence to prove that the elevated seat, perhaps even the chair, existed in India prior to the arrival of the Europeans. References to elevated seats and single seats have been found in the Buddhist Kulavagas, which, uh, were, well, they weren't written, but at least sort of uh, uh, spoken of in the 4th century BC. Relief panels dated approximately to the 3rd century CE in Nagarchunda Konda and Amravati in Andhra Pradesh reveal elevated seats of various types from thrones to chairs with beaded and braided backs to simple stools. As you can see in the sort of coins on the left, which are part of the Indian Museum collection today, uh, coins from the Guptan period, you can see sort of forms of throne and seats used by people possibly of, of, of some sort of authority and privilege. And yet, this, despite these corroborations, the elevated seat in its innumerable expressions has become an indicator and often direct measure of westernization, indeed modernization, and pursuing progress despite multitude reasons, physical, practical, communal, cultural, ritual, for sitting closer to the ground. This standpoint is evidenced by a colonial engineer in 1851, deputed to set up a karkana or workshop in India, who wrote that raised seats were one of those natural steps towards a higher civilization. He says, in the eyes of an Englishman, the most offensive peculiarity of the Indian workman is his habit of always squatting while at work. He goes on to call the posture indolent and inefficient becoming exasperated when his attempts to create a more civilized standing position for them was rejected. And yet, a hundred odd years before this engineer's statement, so I'm sort of going back a hundred years, we have the case of the surgeon and the East India Company official, William Fullerton, in the 1760s, adopting many Eastern manners. We see him sitting on a baitak, much like we have seen princely figures portrayed, hookah at hand, splendidly clad servants in attendance, fly whisks of loft. Uh, this painting, which I first came across in Amin Jaffa's book on furniture, prompts a number of questions. Did Fullerton adopt Indian manners and customs to adjust to life in the tropics? And yet he's sort of seen here not wearing Indian sort of attire, he's, he's wearing European attire. Was the portrait commissioned to convey his importance and to display equivalence to Indian royalty? It would appear that footnoting the stories of colonial conquests are many stories of the winning over of the cultural imaginations 
and sensibilities of the subjugators themselves by the many symbols and manners of the Orient, in this case, the Baitak and the floor seating posture. This uh, image, of course, is during the period of the East India Company and not a um, hundred odd years later when the British Empire actually uh, took root in India. Quoting the anthropologist Gordon Hughes, I say a fourth of mankind habitually squats in a fashion very similar to the squatting position of the chimpanzee. And the rest of us might squat this way too if we were not trained to use other postures beyond infancy. I argue, and I'm not really alone here, that squatting is where humans, every single one of us, came from. And I juxtapose this point with the Slav squat, which has become a sort of a popular meme, at least a few years back, on how men squat in what was the Soviet bloc countries. The memes that you can actually search for on the internet even differentiate this Asian squat from the Slav squat, you know, the way that you sit. And even uh, help you to distinguish how to find a Western spy the, by the way that they squat, as you can see in this sort of quote from the economist. An ornate seat, more lavishly appointed with finer fabric or more intricate carving, is automatically elevated to a higher status than its plainer cousin. A cyberitic seat, dressed in velvet with gold trimmings, invites boldness and reticence, or an aversion. Chairs at the end of a table, conference or dining, often distinguish themselves simply by armrests or a slightly higher back, confer prominence on the person who assumes it, as do the silk line platform upon which the monk sits across from the devotees seated on the floor, and the charpoy to the head of the village as he addresses villagers who stand or sit before him. The legacy of reverence and uh, distinction afforded to a person, often a wise man or a sage, sitting cross-legged in Padmasan on the floor or on the chair in the middle of the room, remains mostly unquestioned. However, Parushrama, the avatar or reincarnation of Lord Rama, sometimes called Rama with the axe, is seen here adopting a posture quite contrary with his assumed identity of sage. His stance posture is sort of strong, fearless, as opposed to that of a calm, prudent savant. While his garb may be that of an austere sort of guru, his posture itself conveys strength and valor, signaling his true identities. These five figurines, some of you from Bombay, M Mumbai might recognize, are from the Bhaudajilal Museum. So while some seats command authority by certain obvious rules, others defy them. And here is an example of another iconic seat that does this. Gandhi's refusal to ascribe to the ideal of elevation as evidence of progress saw him choosing simply and quietly to sit on the floor. The politics of Gandhi's seat of choice was deliberate and subversive, calculated not only to make his European visitors physically uncomfortable as they sat in Western clothes on the floor at the same level as others in the room, but also one imagines forcing upon them an uneasy inquiry into inherited notions of Western civility. The baitak, his, floor, or his working space, his low writing table, and especially his switch to traditional attire were all parts of a deliberate image building exercise. Gandhi's appropriation of an artisan's posture is a testament not only to the power and mutability of images, but also his own political shrewdness. From its use by the colonists as a justification of the colonial project, the floor seat changed to a liberatory uh, sort of symbol, changing ridicule to respect, even if, as Abigail McGowan states, it did not spark the same kind of popular movement as did his politics of clothing. No other chair reveals the hierarchies and gender disparity in practices of comfort in British colonialism as much as the planter's chair. Mid 19th century paintings suggest that these chairs were initially used in spaces reserved exclusively for men. However, later in the century, they were considered prerequisite for most colonial homes in India, principally found in verandas. 
the low reclining design of the planter's chair demanded a posture considered rather inappropriate for women. Long flat arms extended by means of a second flat plank that swiveled outward to form a foot wrist of sorts upon which legs could be raised up and spread apart, afforded the user repose and relief from the tropical heat. A Victorian lady could hardly be seen seated in, seated in this indecorous manner with its attendant potential for embarrassing indiscretions. Sitting on a planter's re reclining chair was therefore mostly the reserve of men, particularly those with privilege, often the head of the house. This sort of uh, postcard that you see on the right uh, from the Higginbotham's um, bookshop shows and it says just like the master, possibly when the master's away, the servant sort of enjoying the comfort of sitting on this seat. It was an ideal seat from which to authoritatively pontificate on this topic of the day with those seated close by on the edges of their sort of upright seats, listening attentively. Any reclining seats very form suggests a cybernetic wanton lack of self-restraint. The planter's chair went one further, earning itself the colloquial moniker of the Bombay fornicator. And I'd like to thank Chirodi uh, very much for scrambling and finding this image for me at the very last minute at one of the libraries in Mumbai. He shot this at one of the libraries in Mumbai. Power transcends politics. It is an everyday socialized embodied phenomenon. And as a consequence, the offer, the refusal, the presence, the absence, the height, the shape, the size, and the detail of as quotidian an object as a seat can be an everyday means to situate power. To be afforded or assigned a seat is a display of respect and power, while the denial or absence of a seat is indicative of the absence of authority and privilege as it was in the little scene in my gr uh, grandfather's veranda. Even in the 21st century across India, when and if given a choice, women are more likely to opt to sit on up upright chairs. It can be argued that simply standing or sitting on the edge of an upright seat, they can easily spring into attendance. To recline is to have earned concession. When no one else present deserves it more when the important work of the day is done, when no one else is watching. These images on the right are from artist Nilanjana Nandi's project, Hu Jano Hu Khabar, that demonstrates to be viewed and photographed sitting on a chair itself was something women felt uncomfortable with. In fact, the ladies she photographed preferred the prop of their sons on their laps. If there is one chair that stands out from all others post-industrialization, it is the egalitarian monoblock plastic chair found in the street, in waiting rooms, in party halls and museums. No other seat is as commonplace and ubiquitous. Its nondescript character bellies its power. Its very invisibility enables coexistence with an array of other seats and a range of settings. Scorned by formerly schooled designers for its fickle nature as it adopts motifs, mimics wood or fiber finishes, its role in fulfilling everyday needs cannot be ignored or overstated. You often find the monoblock neatly lined up in rows as seats for guests at a wedding reception as they wait to meet and wish the newlywed couple who often sit upon a sort of a kitschy throne. The throne, plush and lined with shiny fabric, set against the backdrop of real or fake flowers, grants the newlywed couple temporary elevated status of king and queen for the day. Much planning and resources are invested in wedding thrones. Wedding planners are sort of tasked with sourcing or creating seats with elaborate and intricate motifs. Four metal finishes replete with embellishment and detail. It is a prop here as it is when dignitaries come to visit or when special guests grace occasions. And time on, it will be recorded for posterity by means of portraits and photographs. As a special seat, it grants the privilege of darshan, of being seen and accessed, 
in a manner otherwise only afforded to the venerated. The wedding throne shows similarities with the traditional throne seats used by royalty, as on the left. And contemporary designer Sandeep Sangaru's flame back chair, though breaking free of formal similarities to a traditional sort of throne chair, emanates a distinction. In conversation with me, he has conceded that it is also reminiscent of the Game of Thrones seat from the popular television series. And I jokingly sort of told him that he should rename this chair from the flame back chair. The introduction of mass produced chairs dramatically altered perceptions of the seat. Chairs crafted of cheaper materials granted greater access. The domain of the powerful and privilege was ceded. Dominant styles imposed straight jacketed post postures that hindered movements of the spine. Industrial materials were rigid and restrictive and forced severe postures. We changed our postures from squatting, legs stretched out freely, unable to move, to confining ourselves to the rigidity of chairs. We then assigned chair sitting as a privileged way of sit being. To illustrate this point, I use these drawings by Madhu, whose thesis pro uh, project at NID explored ways of sitting that break the confines of the traditional chair. What we did not realize along the way is that we have become so dependent on chairs that we let them dictate control and assume power over our bodies. We adopted or sort of adjusted our mannerisms to the chair structures, adding cushions and other props to make them more comfortable, as shown again in Madhu's sketches. Almost as swiftly as access to the chair was granted, ways were sought to improve improvise and even escape the restrictions imposed. It was actually only in the late 1980s, ergonomics as a discipline was introduced in India to the design centers at the Industrial Design Center at IIT, the National Institute of Design, as also in the furniture departments of companies such as Godrej. Experts were called upon to proffer advice on how humans should sit and for how long. Designers in consultation with doctors model chairs that were ergonomically sound, chairs that moved, chairs that forced you to move, such as the motion chair here. So it would appear we are no longer imprisoned by the chair and the chair itself has a more sort of fluid form. And finally, seating was redefined as an animated and not a sort of static activity. We have seen the many ways in which the seat features in political posturing. The organization of power and privilege through varied means follows certain norms in vernacular, colonial, and contemporary expressions of the seat. Elevation, adornment, extravagance are recurrent elements. However, it is the maverick, non-typical seat that we are compelled to appraise more closely. Gandhi's seat on the floor, the humble monoblock, the legendary peacock throne, Seats that break through their place in time and space, defy typecasts, and yet command power. The ones that inspire awe, but also discomfort, as in some ways my grandfathers did, are what we must examine for what they tell us about ourselves, our behaviors, and our conventions. It is also to these that we must look for inspiration and to transcend the typical. I'd like to thank the many people who have helped in putting together this project and I apologize for any oversight in case I've missed out some. I would, however, on this forum, like to name just two in particular who have been key in shaping this project. Uh, Shobha Karunakran, thank you very much for turning every awkward phrasing of mine into something of beauty and clarity. And Georgie Paul, not just for all the design help, but for being steadfast in your support on this as well as the Godrej archives for their vision for having sort of helping uh, realize this project. 
This painting, a portrait of Begum Samru, a one-time notch girl and later ruler of a small principality in Uttar Pradesh, shows her sitting in the middle alongside someone who may well be her European husband, while the others in her household surround her, some who have been permitted the use of a chair, others sitting on the ground or sitting at different distances as a reminder of their status. I really could not resist putting up this meme that has been sort of going around all over the internet um, that I saw on the Heritage Lab Instagram a few days back. This one is especially for you, Abigail McGowan, who is from Vermont, who incidentally has contributed a piece for our book. So this is for you, Abby, um, to share with the Mitten Lady. Thank you very much, all of you, for having listened and um, so patiently. Thank you.